Oh, what? Uh, I didn't even watch it. The uh, wait, the mini iPad mini has a, the Galaxy S5 has one on it. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. I think. Is that right? <laughs> Is that well? They I don't know. They they try out some some of their own stuff too, right? <laughs> Fair enough. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to lecture ten, I think, of CSE fifty three twenty three seventy three twenty three mobile sensing learning and control. Okay, so. Um, Thank you for everyone that submitted your projects on Friday. I hope you had a good weekend um, away from it for a little while. Um, so I'll have uh, grades for A2 up sometime this week. Um, I don't have them up yet. Um, I will go through and I'll, you know, I'll have a detailed thing. And basically, whoever turned in um, on Blackboard, the same thing, they'll have my comments from the entire Excel sheet. Um, and I'll see if I can find a better way of incorporating that feedback in so that you can see all the breakdown of every single part of your score. Um, A3 was going to be due this Friday. I'm going to make it due Monday um, so that you have a weekend to do it. Um, the reason that this is a one-week assignment is because it's pretty straightforward. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you need to do, we have already done via a demo in class. Right? So um, I'm going to say that A3 is due Monday, March 3rd uh, at 6 p.m. So that'll be an hour after this class, a week from today. Okay, so essentially you'll have time to show me your app if you wanted to after class. Don't work on your app during class. I don't think I need to say that, but maybe I do. Um, so essentially what A3 is going to be is I want you to create an iOS example um, that uses the template that we created in class to display the number of steps that a user has walked today and the previous day. Okay, pretty simple. We already went and wrote all of the code to do that. Yeah. Um, display a real-time count of the number of steps a user has taken today, which is something we've already done. Um, display the number of steps until the user reaches a user-settable daily goal, which is something we already did. Um, displays the current activity of the user, whether they're being still walking, running, or whether they're in a car. Again, something that you already have a code base for, right, from the demo example. Um, I want you to then estimate the number of stairs that someone has climbed, which is not something that you can query the M7 chip for, right? Um, I just want it to be a course estimate. Do you know what I mean? I want you to estimate the number of steps that someone has climbed, and as long as it's pretty close, it's good. What do I mean by pretty close? Uh, within about 10 to 20 steps, if I'm doing these, this flight of stairs out here. Right? So if I'm going from the third floor to the first floor, if it's within 10 steps, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, The number of stairs that I climb. Um, extra credit will be, uh, I'll give you up to a half a point. Yeah, question. When you say climb, do you mean? Like I mean going up or going down. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll just make it to where you're climbing up. All you have to do is count the number of stairs where you're actually um, exerting effort going up. So this will be like a wellness application. We don't really care how often you're going downstairs, but how many stairs you've actually climbed is something I'm interested in. How's that? Everybody okay with that? So number of stairs climbed, not descended. We'll leave it at that. Um, for extra credit, um, if you want to use the vibration of the motor to tell me whether um, someone is gripping the phone, with a lot of pressure, a medium pressure, um, or low pressure. Okay, and that is completely extra credit up to a half a point if you want to do it. Um, and if you do want to do that and you want some guidance on it, come talk to me. We're not going to talk about it during lecture. Um, but if you want some extra credit for it, it's absolutely there. And I, I can give you more details if anyone's interested. Okay, but essentially I want you to tell me when I'm squeezing the phone. 
based on the motor. Okay. Um, the application should make use of the M7 coprocessor whenever possible. Okay. So essentially, if you can query the M7 processor for part of this or all of this, then do it. Right. Don't write your own algorithm if the M7 is doing it for you. That's all I mean by that. And make the user interface engaging. You know, have a little fun with this. The only like you you can display the steps however you want to. Right, as long as I know the actual value that it comes back. So if it's on a graph, that's great. If it's on a label, eh, maybe not as engaging or persuasive. Okay, but that's still fine. I'm not going to take off for it. Um, I'm just going to give credit for it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So today I want to do a very very quick review of the raw motion sensors that we did last time. Then I'm going to go straight into the demo. Um, and uh, during that demo, I'm also going to show you how to use one of the APIs from Apple for uh, graphing onto the screen. Uh, we've already done kind of our own graphing, which was a very fast graphing that we needed to do. Um, now that we have access to the motion sensors, we can graph at a lower frame rate, and we can make use of some of the APIs that Apple puts out for graphing. Okay? Today, we are going to end our discussion of motion and accelerometers and all of that. We're going to start getting into image processing, uh, maybe at the very, very end. Okay. Um, so the image processing assignment is not due until the week after spring break. So essentially you have next week, spring break, and then the week after spring break, and then the image processing assignment will be due. Okay. Happiness. Good. Okay. So for accessing the accelerometer, um, again, there was this class called CM Device Motion. Um, that we can query and this is an instance we create an instance of device motion and essentially we get that back in our start update function I'll go over that in just a second but um, essentially for acceleration we have device motion dot gravity and user acceleration and each of those are class instances of CM acceleration at which we can query the X Y and Z direction that someone is accelerating right so we know which direction gravity is and we know which direction the user is handling the phone for accessing the gyroscope, which we talked about last time, again, uh, what we're going to do is use the device motion dot rotation rate, and that's going to give us a class called CM rotation rate, in which we can query these variables right here, which is rotation rate dot x dot y and dot z. So that tells you the velocity at which the phone is turning in either one of those axes that we defined over here by the right hand rule. Questions on that? No, good, moving fast. All right, the iPhone also has a magnetic bias field that we talked about last time. Um, so again, we're going to use the device motion, except this time we're going to do the dot magnetic field, which is an instance of a class CM calibrated magnetic field. Uh, that has uh, two classes, the magnetic field dot accuracy, which will tell you whether the magnetic field has been calibrated by the user when you're doing this and how good it thinks that estimate is. So low, medium, or high accuracy. If, uh, if one of these ever came back low, uh, you might flag something for an NS notification, say, hey, if you want, you know, tell the user, if you want to do a calibration for the magnetic field, you can go into the settings and calibrate. Okay? You really only need that magnetic calibration when you're calibrating to the Earth, right? The magnetic field of the Earth. And that's because the magnetic field of the Earth is an extremely weak magnetic field, but at least it always tells you if you're pointing north or south. Okay? So it's something we can tune into. Um, uh, then, but if you just want to know generically the magnetic field that's around the phone, again, you can use this X, Y, and Z to tell you um, where the lines that are pointing towards the South Pole in the magnetic field are that we talked about last time. Is everybody okay with the direction of the magnetic field and how it would come to you on the phone? You actually don't have to use this in any of your labs, but if you were going to create a very kind of cool application where you're moving magnets around the phone, this would be something that you could use and sell. Okay, moving on. Um, the last thing we talked about was uh, the attitude of the phone, um, which is essentially a fused um, algorithm for getting roll, pitch, and yaw. And it fuses all of the information from the accelerometer, all of the information um, from the gyroscope and the magnetometer such that you can get the raw motion of the phone. So if you were to take the phone and strap it onto a quadcopter, you'd be able to tell what the quadcopter was doing in any axis of rotation. Come on in. 
All right. So roll or essentially yaw right here is in the xy plane, right? So the phone moving like that. Pitch in the yz plane, essentially the, mo the phone moving forward and backward. And then roll in the xy plane, so it tells me whether or not I'm moving it this way or that way. Like this. Okay? Happiness. Good. Um, so everything that we've talked about comes from the... Um, device motion manager. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to declare an instance of this thing called CM motion manager, right? So I'm going to do a declaration for this motion manager. Um, then uh, once I've created this property for my class, I'm going to do self.mmanager alloc init it, right? So I'm going to instantiate it. I'm going to check whether or not device motion is capable, right? Because this is something that could be run on an iPad. It could be run on an iPod um, where the user doesn't have access to all of this information that you're trying to get. Okay, so if it is capable, then I'm going to call this thing called self.mmanager uh, and I'm going to send a message to my motion manager, which is set device motion update interval, and that is my sampling rate, my sampling interval in seconds. What was the fastest rate? Does anybody remember the fastest rate that I told you you could sample from the device motion? 100, 100 hertz, right? So you're only going to be able to detect hertz are essentially movements that are going back and forth at a sine wave that is up to 50 hertz, right? That is, I can't even move my hand 50 hertz, 50 times a second, okay? But you can imagine putting this on a motor, right? Or if you had this in your car and you wanted to detect the vibration of the car, okay? Or, I don't know, if you had this and you were looking at the compass that was coming in and you set your phone down right next to the engine and based on the magnetic readings coming off the engine, you were trying to figure out the RPM of the car without connecting to the little um, BSD port. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Not a clue? Don't worry about it. If anybody has that idea, I would love to do that project. Okay? We'll just make lots of money. Okay. Um, so essentially I'm going to give it a sample rate in seconds, so it's going to be 1 over 100 if I want to sample as fast as I can. Um, right, so those are going to be push updates. You can also set this up in a polling manner, right, where you want to poll and just get the device motion at any one time. That's fine, you can do that. Um, for most of the applications that we deal with, we're going to want to get pushed that notification so that we're certain what sampling rate it's coming back from. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so the queue to run on is going to run on the main queue right here. And then um, inside of this block handler, I'm going to have device motion and I'm going to have any errors that occurred, right? So here's all of those device motion variables that we just talked about that we want to get access to. And I can access these. I'm going to get a new device motion 100 times per second. And I can access all of these fields 100 times per second, up to, right? I can actually go faster. It's just I'm not going to get new data. Right, so there's the data. What was the problem that we talked about last time with this? Anybody remember? Yeah, I'm running on the main queue. And why is that bad? Because I'm running at 100 hertz on the main queue. It's, I have a lot of potential to block the UI. Okay? So essentially, we're going to want to create our own queue when we do this demo. All right? Happiness? All right, so... We're also going to do a device motion demo. Um, so essentially, uh, it's going to be a motion plotter. This is going to be real similar to one of the um, motion plots that Apple puts out. Um, so essentially, uh, I'm, we're going to do some custom views, and I'm going to show you how to do a simple grapher from the Apple API. Essentially, what we're going to use here is this APL graph view, which inherits from UI view, and it allows us to graph uh, three different streams, an X, a Y, and a Z stream. Why they named it that, I have no idea. Those are just three different plots that is going to plot over time. All right, so essentially if I have a graph view and I call this function on it add X, Y, and Z, those are going to be different streams. X is going to be plotted in red, Y is going to be plotted in green, and Z is going to be plotted in blue, I think. Okay, so those are three different scatter plots. And as I add more data, it's just assuming that the time interval is the same. So it's not going to give me an axis on the time, but it is going to tell me the y-axis. And this will become a little bit clearer when we do the demo, too. 
to use APL Graph View, we're going to go into our view controller. We're going to create a generic view, drag it into our storyboard, and then I'm going to tell it to subclass APL Graph View. Okay? And then I can drag outlets to it and I can do all my functions that I want to do with it. Okay? All right. So let's do this. Um, so this is the motion demo that we did last time where essentially we had the step counter in there and we had a bunch of other stuff. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here to my main storyboard. Um, and so I'm displaying steps. I'm displaying running. I'm going to go ahead and leave all of that in there. What I'm going to do is just add a graph that we want to graph all the motion device, device updates to. Um, and that's going to happen right here. But before I do that, I want to get my CM device motion grapher, uh, my CM device motion up and running. Okay, so the first thing that I need to do here, I'm going to add a property. That property is strong, right? Not atomic. And it was a CM, what was it, motion manager? There it is, CM motion manager. All right, and we're going to call it um, CM motion manager. Okay, good. Um, so, that's not very good. CM manager for CM motion activity manager and CM motion manager. Let's call this CM device motion manager. Okay? I really don't like that. I'm going to change this. CM manager, That's this is not good naming. Is this okay? Right click, refactor, rename. Um, instead of CM manager, I want this to be CM activity manager. Preview. Yeah, change everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so now I've got a CM activity manager and a CM device motion manager. Much better. Okay? So the best way to instantiate this thing is going to be with, surprise, surprise, lazy instantiation, right? So I'm going to CM motion manager star, and this is going to be my CM device motion manager. Um, let's say if um, not underscore CM device motion manager, I want to do some stuff with it, otherwise we want to return it like that. Um, so if it hasn't been instantiated yet, what's the first thing that we need to do? Check if it's available. What's, did anybody remember me just complaining last time about this? I have to alloc and init this before I can check whether the device is even capable, right? So there's no class function that allows me to go, oh, CM motion manager is motion available. I have to alloc and init it before I can call that instance of that class. I feel like that is someone putting a minus sign where they should have put a plus sign in their public API. Okay? Who knows? Um, so the first thing we're going to do is underscore CM device motion manager. That equals CM motion, oop, sorry, motion manager. Oh, what's going on here? Weird. I don't know why I didn't auto detect that. So I'm going to alloc and knit it. Then I'm going to say if underscore CM device motion manager is device motion available. If it is, we're going to do something. Else, what am I going to do? Yeah, essentially, I'm going to set it to nil. OK? Because that's essentially what would have happened in this getter, right? That's what we did right here, right? If underscore CM activity manager, if it's available, I'm going to set it to something. Otherwise, I'm just going to leave it and return it to nil, right? for everything that I have there. If I never instantiate it, it is nil, right? Because it's a strong pointer. If I don't set it up, it's equal to nil. OK. So, um, so I've allocated and init it. Um, I think that's all I need to do, actually. Because I've allocated and knitted it here. 
that good? Right? So this is um, essentially, let's just do this. We're going to say if if not available, we'll set it to nil. Otherwise, we'll just leave it allocated and initialized. Okay? So down here, why don't we go ahead and create a new function, which is start motion updates. Okay? So set up a new function, start motion updates. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to say if self.cm motion manager is motion available, which hopefully it is. Um, then the first thing that I wanted to do here was back in my code up here. I'm essentially going to set device motion update interval, right? So I'm going to call this CM set device motion update interval. And we wanted it to be 1 over 100. Yes, questions? Um, what do you need to check again if it's available? Is, does, doesn't that happen on Rockway when you like, manage it? It does. It does. The only reason that I'm checking here is because essentially you, you, you could. You, you could just, you know, like if it's going to return nil, you can go ahead and send messages to nil, right? So I could be sending this set device motion update interval and just nothing happens. No, but I mean, you could just say it's <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Let's do that. Everybody okay with that? One divided by one hundred. Point zero. Point zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Semicolon. Um, here, let me let me move this up on the screen here. Okay, next thing we want to do here is uh, put the handler in there, yeah? Right? So essentially we've got self.cm device motion manager um, start. Okay, there are a bunch of um, old things in here where you could say, oh, start accelerometer updates. That is going to give you raw accelerometer readings. Or you could say start gyro updates. That is going to give you raw gyro updates. It's not going to have any of the fused information that we talked about before. Right, so essentially what I want here is I want to start device motion up, oh, updates to fine. You don't want to auto update, don't auto update. I want I wanted it to fill in all of this for me. Start device motion updates to queue. There. Okay. So I need an NS operation queue. So NS operation queue. Put on the main queue here. Really happy with myself. Handler, voila. I just double clicked on that so that it filled this in. And I'm just going to move this back a little bit. OK. Yes, sir. Absolutely. We did not want to run on the main queue. Let me put the handler in there first. Okay, so what is that? Whatever. Um, okay, so I guess what I'm going to do here is plot acceleration from the user. Okay, so I've got the CM device motion. I'm going to say motion. Um, let's just do an NS log here. So NS log of uh, percent at, I'm just going to print off the entire user acceleration right here. So motion dot user acceleration. Okay, that's going to print off the X, Y, and Z values for me accelerating the phone. All right, so let's just make sure that this is running. What? 
It's not of type ID. That's an actual class. Fine. Uh, percent 0.2 f will print off the x direction acceleration. Okay. So we'll print off the x direction acceleration, but we did not want to run this on the main queue, right? We actually wanted to create our own. So a couple of things that we could do here. Um, what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to create an ns operation queue, and we're going to call it my queue. That is going to be equal to ns operation queue. And then I'm just going to allocate and init it here. So I allocated and initiated, initiated my queue. I'm going to tell it to run on my queue instead of the main queue. Is there anything else that I want to do here? It'll start running to that queue because I'm I'm a, I'm actually passing that queue as an argument to start device motion updates. So it's going to start updating everything onto that queue. When I create something, it starts out as a concurrent queue, right? Do I want a concurrent queue with this data? Do I? It depends. It's a design thing, right? Perhaps I want this to only process one after another. Does that make sense? When I have one sample come in from the accelerometer, perhaps I want to do something with that. I don't want to spit them out concurrently. Right? I want them to happen sequentially. Okay? So that I never get one accelerometer update because I got stalled somewhere in some of my code and I get one before the other and now it looks a little funny. Okay? So I'm going to make this a, a serial queue. The way that I'm going to do that is my queue dot max concurrent operation count equals one. Done. Okay? So now, uh, let's see here. I'm going to run this on the device. Don't not run this on the device. Okay? You have to run this on the device. Why? It's the only way you can get this kind of data that's coming from the phone. This is not supported in any way, shape, or form any way, shape, or form from the emulator. Okay, you try and run this on the emulator, it's going to say, is device motion capable? No. And return. All right, so I'm going to run it on my phone right here. And essentially, we're just going to have it spit out some data. So I'm going to look down here. And nothing's happening. It's not accelerating. It's not accelerating? No. It should be, even if it's not accelerating, I get I get I'm gonna get fifty, you know, a hundred times a second. Anybody know what's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have not called start motion updates. Alright, so if you did load, I'm gonna start motion updates. Self start motion updates. Okay, let's see if that works now. Hey, look at that. Got my phone over here. 0 0.001 coming back. Hey, here it is running on the phone, which is great. Can't see anything because all I'm doing is NS logs. But if I move it to the X directions, I'm going to break this phone. I'm, like, I'm just going to. Okay, good, good. Good. So we're getting it. 100 hertz. Awesome. And we have data that's coming and just spitting out right here. Right? What are we going to do with all of this data? Graphic. Let's graph it. Let's do it. I like your style. Good idea. Okay, so let's graph it. How am I going to graph it? Well, the first thing I'm going to need here is I'm going to go over to this bad little boy right here. Okay, APL graph view. Um, I'm going to just take this and drag it into my project, and then you will have it also in your project. Copy items into the destinations group folder. Finish. 
All right, so now I've got an APL graph view. Hey, look, it's provided by Apple. They wrote it in 2012, which means it's ancient. ancient. That's fine. All right. If you want something else, it's great. It's it's pretty fast. All right, and it's not a terrible graphing library. We'll see how it does. There are way better graphing libraries, but this is okay. So now I've got this APL graph. Sorry. So I've got this APL graph view. Its public API is, it inherits from UI view, and I've got add X, Y, and Z into there, and absolutely zero comments or documentation. Wonderful. Okay, so this is the function that I have access to. That's it. That's all we're going to use. Okay, so let's go in here to the main storyboard. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to find a view. That narrowed things down. Everything is a view. Okay, here, represents a rectangular region in which it draws and receives events. I'm going to drag over this view. Voila. Okay, let's just have it go from the left side to the right side. And we'll make it do this a little bit. All right, maybe we want to add some constraints to it. I want to say that, yeah, keep it on the left and the right. Um, keep it a constant height. And it's not so bad. Let's keep it centered within there, OK? So add the missing constraint to keep it centered. Oh, it's going to actually keep it that far away from running. Is that OK? Probably. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is make this of class APL graph view. There it is. APL graph view. Okay, what's the next thing I should do with my APL graph view? So the APL graph view, since I've dragged it into the storyboard, it is automatically going to be allocated and initialized. Okay, the nib is going to call essentially um, init with decoder. Okay, and it's going to take it and unserialize it for me. Okay, we've actually never subclassed a view in this class, but that's what happens. So it's going to be allocated and initialized. The, the view is going to have a strong pointer to that graph view. The only thing that I need to do is get an outlet for it. Yeah. So I'll go over here to my assistant or butler. There it is. Graph view, control, drag. Voila. We will call this graph view. Excellent name. Okay, so now when I go into here, instead of just logging all of this out, what am I going to do? Self dot graph view, add x right here, and I'm going to do motion dot user acceleration dot x, then for the y value. I'm going to do motion, whoop, come on, dot user acceleration dot y maybe. We'll do z motion dot user acceleration dot z. Close brackets, do this right here. Self dot graph you. Oh no, I've got an error. Bad receiver type int star. No. There, there, there it is. Import APL graph view dot h. Okay, so let's get rid of that. No more warnings. I'm all set. Right? So it's gonna work. In theory, it's gonna work. Why might it not work? Hold on, let's just play. Let's play it on my phone. I'm not running on the main queue, look at you guys. I cannot do user interface updates when I'm not on the main queue. Right, so the accelerometer, I'm trying to do some stuff. It's nothing, there's nothing here. It's not doing anything, it's not graphing out. It doesn't allow me, with this class, to update when I'm not on the main queue. 
Absolutely. Stop. So, what do I need to do right here? I can call selector. Um, let's just do this dispatch. Let's do it. Let's do it here. I like this one a little bit better. Dispatch async dispatch get main queue. Right? And then voila, voila. Now what are you doing? Does everybody see what I did there? Dispatch asynchronous, get main queue, call this block of code on the main queue, right? So it's gonna do everything else, it's gonna get my device motion, and then I'm gonna call it and do it on the main queue, right? So I'm gonna call this on the main queue 100 times per second, okay? That's okay because I'm doing a user interface update. What's not okay is I probably could have run this directly from the main queue if all that I was going to do was do a user interface update. Okay, then it would have made sense to call this on the main queue. Is everybody okay with that? But essentially, what if I wanted to do some processing before here? Maybe I don't want to display this on the main queue or I only want to display acceleration readings that are above a certain value. Then it would make sense to, to do this dispatch on the main queue. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so essentially, so the main queue is a serial queue, right? So a serial queue called from another serial queue, I'm going to be adding them in serial, right? Now, if I had set this up without the concurrence, you know, with more than one concurrency, I might not be guaranteed that, right? Because this could be added onto the main queue in any order. Once it gets on the main queue, it'll execute sequentially though. Fair enough? Okay, let's play, let's see if it worked. Misplaced view. Oh, we'll fix that in a second. Oh, look at that. Okay, so the way that it's graphing is that it graphs something and then it just moves it to the left. I'm oh, sorry. It just moves it to the left and the right. Okay, so until it's set a min and a max value for the graph, it's not really doing too much. I'm moving this in the x direction, right? The y direction, and the z direction. Huh? No, it's from the slides. Go back and look. You know what I mean? The x, y, and z direction from the slides. So x. Oh, but the colors that are here. No, I only know the colors because I've messed with this graph view for debugging. This is. It's like the Arsenio Hall app right here. You guys don't even know who that is. It's fine. It's in the 90s, during my childhood. Um, what's that? Did he really? Does he really? Anyway, okay, we're way off topic. So, anyway. So, there it is. We're good to go. Everybody okay with CM Device Motion Manager and plotting accelerometer updates? Okay. All right, so we're done with device motion. You guys can step count. We're good to go. We're not quite done yet. Um, so, here, come back. Yes, here. No, don't do that. Okay. I forgot I had a tie on. Um, okay. Okay, so essentially what we want here is the phone trajectory, okay? Let's say we were doing step counting or we wanna get the trajectory of the phone based on the accelerometer, okay? Um, there's lots of different types of trajectory that you could do. Um, so like if you're interested in what direction is the phone or user headed, direction could be a cardinal direction, which is north, south, east, and west. It could be the altitude of someone, right? So whether they're at sea level, plus 30 feet, which way they're headed. It could be relative altitude, whether or not they're just moving up or down, or relative trajectory. So left, right, straight. Okay? Happiness. How would I sense 
each of these? What's the best way to sense each of these? Cardinal direction. What should I use? Yeah, the magnetometer. Okay, what if I want altitude? What if I want altitude sea level, like relative to sea level? I want absolute altitude that someone is at. Did you say GPS? GPS. All right. With GPS, it used to be when they when they deregulated GPS in 1990, right? Um, it used to be that you had you had access to three satellites and you could triangulate your position, right? Eventually, that became five satellites. So now you can triangulate your position and get your altitude. And there's all sorts of error checking and things that happen from known um, altitude antennas that get sent back up to the GPS, and they tell you what altitude you're at. Right? So essentially, you use GPS if you want relative altitude. And you can get altitude above sea level or below sea level. OK? What if you want to do relative altitude? If I just want to know if I'm going up or down? Accelerometer is a pretty good option. I like that one. Essentially, the motion sensors, right? Left, right, straight, motion sensors, probably roll pitch yaw in combination with the accelerometer would be a good way to do it. Yeah, maybe. You guys don't have to implement that one, but we are going to implement up and down accelerations, right? Okay. Um, so the questions that we have for up-down movement are, are we accelerating? In what direction are we accelerating? And are we accelerating opposite of gravity? Yeah? That's all we want to know. I want to know which direction is gravity, and am I going in the direction or opposite the direction of gravity? That's what I want to know for acceleration. Which way is gravity? Why did I know someone was going to say this? Smart ass. Where's the, which direction is gravity do I know from the phone? What? Negative. Negative. <laughs> so it's the device motion, dot gravity. Sorry. Maybe I was looking for a, a you guys say you went from really simple to really complicated. Anyway, just the device motion, dot gravity. Which way is the phone accelerating? <laughs> dot user. Dot user acceleration. Okay. Each of these are a vector, right? In X, Y, Z. It's a vector in three-dimensional space. How much of one vector is in the direction of another? How do we know that? Does anybody remember this from geometry? A dot, yeah. Let's rock this out. OK, so I have A, I have B. Right? I want to know how much of B is in the direction of A. That's like this. Essentially, I want to project B down onto the direction of A and see what that magnitude is along this right here. Right? The way that I do that is with the dot product a dot b over the magnitude of a. That is the equation for the dot product. Okay, so if b is 5, 5 and a is 5, 2, this becomes 5 dot 5, or sorry, this becomes 5, 5 dot 5, 2 over the magnitude of 5, 2. What is this dot product? 5 times 5, 5 times 5 plus 5 times 2 over 5 squared plus 2 squared. So that's 35 over the square root of 29. It's approximately 6.5. So this distance right here, it just told me, is 6.5 in the direction of A. Voila. OK. So acceleration of the user towards or away from gravity is as simple as taking the dot product here, where we have a CM acceleration, gravity, and a user excel. And I have gravity dot x times user dot x. Gravity y, user y. Gravity z, user z. When I normalize that by gravity, which shouldn't really be changing, but we're going to go ahead and calculate it, because it can have minor fluctuations, we'll have x times x, y times y, and z times z. OK? I could take a square root here, but eh. Right? If I'm just interested in proportionality, then it's fine. So positive acceleration is when I'm speeding up. Negative acceleration is when I'm slowing down. OK. So let's do a demo. 
And now we're actually going to make use of this everything right in here. OK? So what do I want to do here? Well, let's create this thing with float dot product is equal to. Um, so essentially, I'm going to take the dot product between the user acceleration and gravity. And if that dot product is greater than a certain value, I'm going to say that I am accelerating in towards or away from the direction of gravity. OK, why would that be important? Well, for this app, this is going to be don't drop it. This is going to detect when you're dropping your phone. OK? It's supposed to be funny. It's all right. It doesn't have to be. Um, all right, so essentially what I'm going to do here is motion.gravity.x times motion.useracceleration.x plus, oh, come on. Really? What? <laughs> there. Good. Anyway, whatever. I have no idea why that happened. Unless I had caps lock on. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do Y. We're going to do Z. We're going to do Y. We're going to do Z. Voila. What's that? Oh, yeah, you're right. Look at that. All right, so X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Feeling really happy with myself, okay? So the user acceleration in terms of gravity. The next thing we're going to do is normalize that. So I'm going to say dot product, oh, right? If I equals what? Except I just want gravity squared. Is that okay? Dot product divided by equals the magnitude of gravity, right? And the magnitude of gravity is x squared, y squared plus z squared. If I wanted to take square root, I could. Okay? Okay. So now what happens? Let's say if the dot product Let's say if the absolute value of the dot product is greater than 1, maybe a little less, 0 0.8, then I want to do this. I'm going to plot it to the screen. Otherwise, I'm not going to plot it. OK? So let's see what happens here. So nothing's happening. Good. So if I were to move like this or like this, seriously? <laughs> It actually just stopped mirroring. Wonderful. Now I have to reconnect. Hold on. There. But if I move it up or towards gravity, what do I get? Right? So if I'm going to move down here, then So if I move down, what do I see? So up, 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 down, 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 right? So if I'm about to drop my phone, it's going to look essentially like this, where the red, when I'm moving down here, let me just do one comes back. Essentially, I have a value that it peaks up here and then comes right back down. Right? So I'm accelerating in that I'm accelerating 
in the direction of gravity, and then it starts to decelerate as I pull out. Is that okay? You accelerate in the direction of gravity, and then when I caught it, it slowed down, right? So this, I'm accelerating and I'm stopping, I'm decelerating, right? When I go the opposite direction, it's going to be negative, negative, and then positive, right? So I can tell which direction I'm moving in. And it's not going to do anything when I'm accelerating in the other directions unless I move in direction of gravity, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing in the direction of gravity. Oh, look, I'm actually taking steps. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and stop it. Back to here. Okay, so that is the end of our motion discussions. All right, so before moving on, how might you perform step climbing? Anybody want to throw something out there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like if you had this in your, like even if, even if I was just holding it and walking upstairs, right? You don't have to detect this when the app is in the background. The only time you have to do step counting is when the app is active, right? So the app can be sitting there getting motion updates. So if you're moving up the stairs, you should be seeing some initial accelerations in that direction, up the stairs. How would I know how many stairs that I've climbed? Combine the step counter and the motions. Okay, so instead of trying to count steps up, you're just looking for whenever those steps are, you know, you, you look back at your history and say, hey, this is in the direction opposite of gravity. That would be an absolutely fine implementation. Okay? How would you debug your algorithm? <laughs> Test it by walking on the stairs. But, I mean, essentially what you're going to be looking for is thresholds, right? That you'll be kind of looking for things to pass. This APL graph view actually is going to graph out the raw numbers. So you can graph out some things and pick a threshold from the graph, right? Or print them out to NS logs and choose based on what you see, right? So if you see a bunch of numbers coming out, only print off the ones that are above 0.8 or above 0.6 and see if you can detect a step when you're actually moving, right? It's probably better if you graph it out because you're not going to want to sit there with your laptop and your phone in your pocket and, and try and NS log and go up and down the stairs. All right. Questions? Do we have to distinguish if there are like keys that have different perspectives in them? Or is it really just a pad that like goes in every direction? You can safely assume it's in a pocket. If it's in a pocket or in a purse, it's going to be almost identical. Almost identical. The right? Axis be the axis will be different, but not away from gravity. Do you know what I mean? Right? So the, the raw, like roll pitch and yaw, like if I was carrying this like in a bag, that would be moving. If it's in my pocket, my leg is also helping with the acceleration, but I'm still going to get these these raw motion updates that are against gravity. Okay? Okay? You will turn your iPhone into a Fitbit. All right. If there's no more questions, we're moving on to images. Okay, so image processing. Um, this is actually one of my more favorite topics to actually go into. Um, so what do I mean by image processing? Well, when I'm talking about image processing, I also want to distinguish what I'm not talking about. So essentially, image processing is the art and science of manipulating pixels, right? And I mean that in the rawest sense of the term, right? So this is things like um, if you're combining images, that's known as blending or compositing, um, enhancing edges and lines that are in an image, adjusting contrast. If you're warping an image or doing a transformation to the image to, say, like skew it in some, in some manner or way. If you're blurring it, right, 
if you're doing an enhancement to the sharpness of it. Essentially, anything that you can do in Photoshop would be considered image processing. It's used in computer vision. Image processing is not computer vision. Okay? When I say computer vision, computer vision is trying to look at an image and distill some knowledge from it. Okay? So essentially, it could be like tracking an object that's in a scene. That's not image processing. That is computer vision. Realizing that a face is in an image, that is computer vision. That is not image processing. Everybody okay with that? Right? Essentially, anything that your eyes can do is image processing. Anything that your brain can do is computer vision. Right? It's interpreting images rather than enhancing them or distilling the pixels down. Something. So everything in here that you see, when you take a photo and you have all of these options down here, all of that red eye reduction, that's kind of a mix between computer vision <coughs> and image processing. Would you guys agree? Yeah? So this auto enhance right here, would you call that image processing or computer vision? I would call it, I would call it image processing too. Yeah. I forget what this button does. Anyway, um, so essentially those are the differences that I wanted to talk about with image processing and computer vision. The first thing we are going to talk about is image processing. Next week we'll talk about computer vision. So the first thing to understand is that images are data, right? We started off this with audio. Audio was data. Images are data. They can be represented in many, many, many different ways, okay? So essentially if you wanted to... Um, represent an image for something that you were going to render onto the GPU, you would represent it in one fashion. If you were going to represent it in something so that you could do manipulation and filtering on it, you might want a different class representation of an image. But no matter what the representation or class representation that you're using, um, the most common form is you're going to want access to the pixels that are inside of an image. Okay? So each pixel inside of an image in the most common format that you're going to use is this format called BGRA. Okay, what does this stand for? Blue, green, red, alpha. Absolutely. So each pixel is going to have a blue value, a green value, a red value, right, which tells you the true color of something that was displayed, you know, if you were taking this from the camera. <laughs> then it's going to have an alpha value, which is telling you its transparency. Okay? Alpha isn't really used all that much in image processing as much as it is in graphical rendering. Is that okay? Good. Um, so images is data. We're going to be, this BGRA representation is used for both capture and display. So what I mean here is that light is not pixels, right? If we want to digitize light, we need to digitize it in the same way that we take audio and digitize it from the microphone. Right? Light is continuous. What is light? It's a wave. It's a wavelength. Right? What determines the color of a light? It's wavelength. Right? So, or it's frequency. Right? They're reciprocals of each other. Right? So a very high frequency wave, as long as it's in the color spectrum, is going to look different as you change the frequency of that wave, it's going to be a different color. Okay? But when we talk about frequency with images, we're usually not talking about color. Right? When we're talking about color, we're talking about a pixel and usually a red, green, and a blue value. Right? It's become so commonplace to talk about RGB, color spaces, that it's a little, it might be a little deceptive on what we're really talking about and what that representation is. What we're trying to represent is the wavelength that any light is at. So we've got three different sensors, okay? A blue, a green, and a red sensor, right? That is why we have BGR representations, right? So inside of each pixel inside of your camera, there's this array of sensors called a CCD, right? And every single pixel has multiple sensors that are giving it a blue, a green, and a red value. Why is it that that is a good representation that tells us the wavelength or the, the color of that light. We can approximate the wavelength by looking at a sum. If you look at the sensitivities of each of these sensors, 
Essentially, what I have right here is the sensor's sensitivity to different frequencies of light, and then the wavelength of light, right? So if I have a pure blue light that comes in, right? So blue right here. Uh, this is backwards. Anyway, so essentially, no, no, it's not, no. So if I have a blue wavelength of light that comes in right here, this sensor right here with the blue line is most sensitive to blue light, right? So depending on the wavelength that comes in, right, I might see that the blue value is something that's really, really high, right? And that would tell me that that light is mostly blue. Okay, if this light is mostly green, it's maybe only going to excite this sensor. If this light is mostly red, it's only going to excite this sensor. What the beauty of this is that these sensors overlap with one another. Okay, so if I have a wavelength of light that's say 500 nanometers down here, and it comes in, then it's going to predictably excite the blue channel and the green channel in a predictable way. Right, so if I take the sum of those two values, or not the sum, but if I look at each of those two values, it tells me, it gives me a really good estimate of the wavelength of light that came in there. Is that okay? Is that is it okay? Yeah? And essentially the same thing. If it's exciting both green and red together, you know, depending on how it excites the red and green values, it kind of tells me which wavelength of light is coming in here. All right? So RGB is the same way that your eye senses color. We have red, green, and blue photoreceptors that are inside the eye that tell us wavelengths. And it's a combination of those that our brain interprets as color. Right? And that's where you get people like me that are colorblind. So there's a little bit of things wrong. Right? And actually 60% of the men in here are colorblind too. You maybe not maybe you don't know it. But you're gonna have trouble distinguishing dark colors. Anyway. It's one of those it's one of those Y chromosome things. Okay? You just don't have, anyway, it's fine. Everything from audio that we have still applies. So we're going to be talking about images as signals, right? So when we were talking about audio, we talked about this thing called quantization, right? Where we couldn't represent a continuous audio value. In the same way here, we can't represent a continuous color value from the sensors, right? So we have to quantize it. Um, actually, the quantization on each pixel is going to be even more than that. Usually, we're going to come back with 0 to 255. We're talking about 8-bit color. Okay, so the first kind of artifact that we get from quantization comes from trying to stretch out images, trying to enhance the contrast, right? So if we have a low light image right here, can you guys see anything inside there? Yeah. Just there's a little, there's like a little something inside. This was taken in a really dark environment, right? And so the sensor values, like all of the sensor values, are between like zero and I don't know, like thirty or something, maybe zero and fifty. Right? But there's only 50 levels of color in between there. So if I try and stretch that out and like multiply everything times 3 so that I, I take up the full kind of color values from 0 to 255, right? so, or I guess multiply by 5, this is what I get. Right? Little McDonald's figurines here. The, essentially what I get here is I see a bunch of false colors, right? Because... When I was capturing this data, all of that data was quantized to only 50 levels down here. And now when I expand it out, I'm starting to see a lot of false coloring, right? The sensor data was quantized, and therefore it's not a really great representation of the actual color. Is that okay? So why an artifact of quantization? This is a really common thing, right? So if you're trying to, like, enhance an image that's really low light, sometimes this will come back as that, right? It'll just be an, an awful image. You can see all these false, like, blue colors where all of the sensor data was really dark and there was some noise there. I'm going to multiply all of that noise to get quantized levels that didn't really exist before. Um, and the same thing here, like if you were to take an image of a cat, um, if you really, really zoomed in on this, some of these you might actually see the different quantization levels of gray if you really, really zoomed in, right? So going into that right there, you can actually see these quantized levels, right? There's only so many colors or gray levels we can represent. But the number of gray levels that the human eye can represent is around 50. right? So if we have 255 levels of gray, we can fool any human being. 
Okay, until we start processing those and those quantizations start messing up. Okay. Sampling errors. Okay, so sampling errors that we had for audio were what? Aliasing, right? We had high frequencies that aliased back down as low frequencies if we didn't cut them back out. With images, specifically with video, we're going to have to worry about two types of quantization. All right? What's the first? Quantization in time. If we're not capturing images fast enough, then this is when you get this effect over here, like say when you're, when you're taking a video of a tire, right? So if you're sampling, if you're not sampling fast enough, that tire's moving very, very, very quickly. And it aliases back down and it looks like it's moving a lot slower, right? So it, it eventually, oh, it's moving really fast, but it's quantized to a level that's much lower frequency that we can actually see, right? So that's aliasing in time. There's not a whole lot we can do about that because all we can do is 30 frames a second on the iPhone. They do have a slow-mo thing. Um, you don't have access to that yet. You do have, you could, you can tell it that you want to do a capture session that is 60 frames a second and you can get the video afterwards, but you can't, you can't live capture straight off of the camera. Not yet. You will. It's just, it's a pretty new feature. So they haven't exposed it yet. They, they assumed it wasn't, they said it wasn't ready. Um, you're also going to have aliasing, aliasing in terms of the resolution of what you're capturing. Okay? So essentially what you have right here is when you're not sampling in space quickly enough. So what do I mean by, and this is normally what we talk about when we're talking about the frequency that's inside of an image. This image right down here, this is low frequency. And it's, we're talking about frequency across space that we're capturing. Okay? This is like the number of pixels that you have. Right? So this would be a high frequency in an image. Does everybody see this? Every other, say every other pixel is, crap, is, is capturing light and dark. Okay, so this would be a high frequency image. If you don't capture that at a high enough rate, if your resolution of your camera, you get aliasing. This is why if you saw someone on a, like if, they, if you saw someone on television that had on pinstripes and they're moving around, it looks like they have these weird frequency patterns that come across their, their shirt, right? This is before HD. But you, have you guys seen this before? Right? Essentially, you weren't capturing at a high enough resolution. And so the, those high-frequency pinstripes that were there alias back down to these low-frequency things that are moving around on someone's shirt. Okay? Or if someone's wearing plaid. All right? So here's an example of an image with lots of high frequency. Okay? Nature's a pretty good example when you're in a forest. So there's some, some pretty good frequency content there. Yeah? So this is a high frequency. I want everyone to be okay with these concepts. There's a high frequency because, yeah, if you were to look at the lights and the darks in this, it's moving around really, really quickly. Like every time there's these, there's lots of skinny trees, right? So this is a high frequency image, right? This right here is a more low frequency image. This has low spatial frequency, right? And it's just because, you know, if you were to imagine sine waves, that you just drew onto a, a canvas, right? This is low frequency. All right? Okay, so I'm not gonna make you take FFTs of images, although you can, and that's how filtering is done a lot with images. You can take a two-dimensional FFT, multiply it in the frequency domain, and then take the inverse FFT, and you'll have a different kind of image, right? So if you do a low-pass filter, that would be blurring the image, okay? Instead, the way that we normally do filtering of an image, um, it's actually the same as audio, right? So we had this thing called convolution that I introduced in a lecture a long time ago, and it was essentially we had this filter, and we multiplied it by the audio that was coming in, right? So we multiplied it and added it up, and that gave us the current value. With an image, we're going to do the exact same thing, except it's going to be 
a little more obvious what's going on. So let's say that this right here is my filter, okay? A filter with an image is normally called a kernel. What I'm gonna do for convolution is I'm gonna take this filter and point by point, I'm gonna move it across this image, I'm gonna multiply it with the pixels, add it up, and replace the pixel that's overlapping this value inside the filter with that value, okay? So if I were to take this, I would multiply 0.11 times the pixel values that are in the image here, add it up, and then save that value right there. And I'm gonna go all the way across the image and save what those values are. And then I'm gonna go down. I'm gonna go against the other row. I'm gonna go across the entire image, multiply and add up those values, and you'll be able to see this is the image that I get back. So if I look at the original numbers that were here, I had one, four, two, five, six, nine. One of the things that you see right here, these are kind of low values over here, and these are kind of high values that are over here. Maybe this represents an edge in an image. Okay, would that be okay? Like this is, if this is, say this is a grayscale value, this right here would represent, say, a dark area followed right by a light area. So it's an edge. Oh, so these are just the values of the gray, of grayscale. Let's say these are the grayscale values, right? So how much luminance, how much brightness is in the image, right? When I, when I take this and move it across everything, one of the first things you notice is that the value, the difference between this pixel and that pixel become closer together. Same thing. The value between all of these values, they get closer together. Why? Because I'm averaging all of these pixels together, right? I'm just averaging them. When you average something together, that's a low-pass filter. And it's a lot easier to see in an image why it's a low-pass filter. It's because it's taking those edges and averaging the values together so they get closer together. And it's blurring. It's blurring the edges that you see right there. That's all it's really doing. Just average them together so it's not such a sharp line. Okay? What if I had a different kernel? A kernel that looked like this. If I were to take this and do a point-by-point -point multiplication and add it up, what happens when I'm in a value of the image that's all of the values are really close together? Anybody know? Everything gets closer to zero. Right? So if I have values over here, so if all of the values that I'm multiplying are, are really close together, they're essentially going to cancel each other out and become zero. If I have values that are very, very different from one another, say like I was on an edge of an image, and I multiplied it by this filter and then added it all up, the magnitude of that is going to be either really negative or really positive. So this is essentially a high-pass filter in an image and it's gonna accentuate where there's edges in the horizontal direction. So if I were to take that and multiply it by this, these are the values that I would get, and you'll notice where that edge occurred before in the image, all of the magnitude of those values got bigger. All right? We got seven minutes left. Well, we're doing great. We're doing great. So, I wanted to do a quick example of the power of some simple filtering, and I'm just going to use a, a MathWorks demo that we have here. Let me see here. Math, no, what is it? CDF? Yeah, Wolfram. Wolfram Alpha. Go CDF. Here we are. Okay. So let me expand this out. Essentially, what this is, this is just a little filter demonstration, and up here, which is kind of hard to see, there's this thing called a kernel matrix. And then it's the value of this 3x3 three three matrix that I'm going to take and convolve with the image. Okay? So those values are negative 2, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 2. And can you guys see this image right here at all? A little bit? Can you see what's going on here? This filter right here is essentially uh, an embossing effect where it takes, when the values over here are very different than the values over here, it accentuates those diagonal lines. 
All right, so you get kind of an emboss effect as you move across it, right? I can do an edges effect. So this is a kernel that it's an eight in the middle and everything around it is negative one, okay? What that does is essentially it takes all of the lines that are in the X direction and all of the lines that are in the Y direction. And it essentially, it, every time that I have an edge, that's going to highlight those, those parts of the filter right there. Right? It's just a multiply and accumulate. So I can do horizontal edges, which maybe is more like this. So this is the exact thing we had. So negative one, negative one, negative one, zeros and ones. And that highlights all of the horizontal edges that I have. Here's all the vertical edges, which go in this direction. Okay? If I multiplied those two matrices together, I would get this. So I can highlight both of the vertical and horizontal edges. Actually, there's a way of combining those, which we don't go into, but... There's also this thing called a Laplacian, which looks like this, a sharpening filter, looks like this. How about a blurring filter? Ah, oh, it's just an average. So it's just 0.11 over there. And you can see when I run that across the image, I get this blurring effect. Okay, I get a nice kind of blurring effect. Okay, any, any questions on this 3x3 three three kernel way of doing things? If you wanted to get more blur, take a bigger kernel, right? So instead of just this 3x3 three three average, I'm going to average 5x5. Five five. And that's really going to start averaging like a lot of pixels together to get the one value. Um, and that's going to give you a better blur. There's also, you also probably don't want to just like take the average of a block. You kind of want to take, you know, a smooth surface, right? So if you, a Gaussian blur, right, if you take a Gaussian, and multiplied it, you'll say if you have a Gaussian in this direction, a Gaussian in that direction, um, that's going to be a little bit, it's going to give you a, a better blur, essentially. Okay? So if I were to kind of soften these edges a little bit, oh, I'm not going to be able to do, I don't have enough control over the, no. Nah. I don't have enough control to actually do it here on the slider. But essentially I can make a little bit better blur by kind of taking those values and tapering them off to zero at the edges of the filter. Okay, we have three minutes left, and so that filters and everything that I just talked about right there, those are linear operations, which means that it's just, um, when we talk about linearity, we're talking about things that are like multiply, divide, add, subtract, right? Filters that do anything that use addition and subtraction, multiply, divide, are linear filters, Nonlinear filters are anything that we do inside of that kernel that's a nonlinear operation, right? So, I mean, we're not just limited to averaging things together. Like, what if I wanted to take a filter and I wanted to round everything off, right? So, I don't need to just form this linear convolution. If I take that filter across and I'm going to say, okay, everything in here, I'm going to round to the nearest value of 10. Anybody know what that would do? Right, so I'm going to take, all, like, say, all of these RGB values. Pixelated. Well, it's not exactly going to pixelate it. Well, that's not true. It will pixelate it. Um, but it's also going to quantize the colors, too, right? Like, if I'm averaging to the nearest 10, it's going to quantize all the colors that are there, right? It's going to give me a posterization effect. Right. I don't know how well you can actually see that now that I'm looking on the projector here. But essentially, if I quantize the colors here, you can see it maybe a little bit better in the lily pads. You can get a cheap posterization effect where it looks like someone's painted on or kind of pixelated and colored the things in. Is that kind of okay where you can kind of see that? What's actually done here is a little more complicated than that, but essentially, if you understand that, that's a nonlinear filter. And I think that's where I'm going to leave you guys today. Next time, we will actually go in. And if you understand nothing about filtering, you're still fine. Because the core image framework allows you to really kind of grab things from filters and use them very, very quickly without even understanding what they do. 
as long as you see what the output is, you're going to be okay. Okay? I want you to know how to use it, not necessarily all of the math behind it. Happiness? We're done. I'll see you next time.